joining us virtually wherever you are in the world we are so pleased to have you with us um, before i hand over to our speaker this morning just a few housekeeping points um, just to note that this session is being live streamed and that we have a photographer and videographer with us i'd also like to ask you to turn your mobile phones on to silent or off please um, there will be time at the end of the session for questions those of you who are with us in person, just raise a hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. For those of you who are joining us online, uh, my colleague Nicola is ready and waiting to receive any questions in the chat and we'll read those out to you, uh, read those out on your behalf. So without further ado, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Parisian. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming, both um, um, live out and online. Delighted to see you all this morning. What I'm going to do this morning is look at truth and falsehood and, and all the stations in between. There's been, of course, much debate in recent months and years about what's truth, what's fake news, a distinction which often seems to escape most politicians when it's convenient. Um, I think one of the things we'll be exploring today is if we repeat falsehoods often enough, it creates an alternative narrative, um, which quickly becomes a, a new orthodoxy. Um, good example is obviously Donald Trump's Stop the Steal campaign uh, for the end of, 20, uh, end of 2020, which culminated in the dramatic and shocking events of the 6th of January. The same debate can be applied to our cultural heritage which in the past has often confused authenticity with, well, to put it kindly, wishful thinking, um, sometimes by accident, sometimes deliberately. My lecture is not designed to demolish, cherish myths or, or undermine much loved landmarks, but I, I suppose that what I'd be asking is to, to look at our cultural heritage in a, a, perhaps a, a broader way, which, in which, for example, recreation, as we see here in this image, um, and the hall's wonderful Tudor building, uh, the extension to Liberty's shop of 1924 to six, 1922 to four, um, actually says more about uh, the, the, the time it is built in rather than the, the, the original style it is seeking to evoke or replicate. Um, let's start with an example close to home of a deliberate falsehood. If this works. It doesn't. Sorry, the. It is not working. Or I'll just do it with one slide. That would be a challenge. Could someone come up and, and mimic the building? So, through the power of power of dance, possibly. Apologies for a minute. Please, thank you. That's it. Let's rush on to, as you can see from the caption at the bottom, to University College, my alma mater, in fact, before I came to here to Kellogg. Um, if you notice that the punchline here is is what it says in the bottom left hand corner of the uh, right hand corner of that postcard founded 
AD 872, um, a deliberate fib. Um, of course, the answer is it is the oldest college in Oxford. Whatever Merton and Bailey will say, Univ is the oldest. But a deliberate fib created as long ago as 1384 to settle a property dispute, which was only finally fessed up to in 1727. And what's interesting, the idea that the, the King Alfred, King Alfred was the founder of Univ, it created a cult which persisted well into the 19th century. Um, the original um, um, perpetrators of the of the lie actually went a bit overboard. They drew up a fake charter for University College, um, which had well basically all the Saxons they could ever think of, um, which included Bede, who was of course uh, around two and a half centuries before King Alfred. But hey, um, he must have lived a long time. Rather more sharply, perhaps, but into the centre of our, our cultural debate. I don't know if many of you know this house, Sutton House in Hackley, a fine National Trust property. Really good example in the past of what John Betjeman um, called antiquarian prejudice, that older is always better, that you know, one Roman brick outranks a Georgian house. Um, and it was um, originally given to the National Trust, who then leased it out to uh, a union. Um, came back to the Trust in 1980 and they resolved to dispose of it, which caused a great hoo-ha in the media and they were forced to do a U-turn and refurbish it considerably. What was fascinating is this is a house of many periods, like so many of our historic buildings, they're not just of one particular inception date. Yes, it was begun in 1535, but it has um, Tudor elements, top left, Georgian elements, and indeed a lovely arts and crafts hall. Um, but one interesting point I thought I'd mention from what was done there was that in looking at this wonderful Tudor linenfold panelling, which sadly a lot of Georgian um, uh, panelling was demolished to, to reveal this again, but there we go. In, in work done, at opening up a, a little cupboard to the left, we found, or, or, or the, the conservation architects, Richard Griffiths, found evidence of the original paint scheme. And just imagine these linen folds. The idea of, of bare wood is such, such a, a concept ingrained in our, in our minds, is it, in, in the 20th and 21st century. In fact, we have evidence that this, each of those panels was originally painted uh, as a linen, um, yellowy white for the, the linen folds with a background of dark green. All those stars and rails were red, brown, mahogany color with gold stars. Imagine that floor to ceiling. What an astonishing room that must have been. But even with this evidence, a senior officer of the National Trust, who shall be nameless because he's still with us, um, said, oh no, um, he said to me, um, oh no, we won't be um, repainting it as it was. It's not what visitors will be expecting to see. <laughs> And that's possibly one of the, the key themes of my lecture today. Often, of course, truth is less dramatic than fiction and may occasionally disappoint. <laughs> so, so, oh, old joke, old joke. Or even, uh, even better slide, or even not live up to its billing or its ambitions. I love the, the both of these. <laughs> Look at that ramp on the right, you know, oh my goodness me, you, know, you get nearly all the way up, but then tough. Um, one thing I really want to look at is the power of expectation, which is often unexpectedly strong. There's a, a strong impulse to believe what we'd like to believe, rather than what actually happened, and we find this in every aspect of our lives. Um, but it's particularly true with historic buildings, historic icons, historic uh, paintings. Film companies, for example, love this interior, which many of you will know. This is the long gallery at Cyan House in Middlesex. Um, it's faded grandeur, in fact, as, as much due to work of 1828 as Robert Adams' original scheme of 1762, approximates the public perception of the past as a dowdy, washed out world of pastel colours. Rather nearer to home, and I'm not being cruel, but Film and TV companies also love Turl Street in Oxford and its environs, which in fact, during the early 19th century from 1817 onwards, was re -tudorized. If you look at earlier views of this street, there's lots of Georgian windows, haphazard frontages, but these three colleges, Exeter, Jesus and Lincoln, were all 
Tudorized, as we say, in the early 19th century, to how it ought to have looked in Henry VIII's time. Not saying it's any worse, but it's, it says perhaps more about the early 19th century than it does about the 16th. Good example of this um, is you can find in, in a very ancient British site, Maiden Castle in Dorset near Dorchester, uh, a venue beloved of, uh, again, of film and literature. Um, much quoted in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, for those seeking to disinter the ancient Britons as a symbol of British resistance and, and isolationism and as a cultural crucible for British values. It was, a, the main castle was of course a central character in Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crown of 1874. In fact, Hardy later made sure that his house Mapsgate could see, he could see um, Maiden Castle out of his window. It was the focus of John Cooper Powers's eponymous novel of 1936. Anyone read John Cooper Powers? I hope, but uh, uh, brave. Yeah, I hope never to have to read another one. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, there's a wonderful John Ireland symphonic rhapsody of 1921 based on this. And of course, um, it was a, a major character in Nicholas Rourke's wonderful 1967 film of Thomas Hardy's book of Far From Madding Crowd. Um, Following the major dig there in the mid 1930s, the larger than life archeologist Mortimer Wheeler, who some of you may remember, who you can see on the left of that right hand picture, um, wove Maiden Castle into a stirring tale of invasion and defiance, centered on a massive Roman attack on this brave British redoubt during Vespasian's invasion of Britain during AD 43. Um, yet indeed, and not surprisingly, Wheeler was more a prisoner of his own time than of um, um, the, the ancient Roman invasion. Um, in 1940, when he was writing up the notes for the dig, Wheeler himself commanded the 48th Light Anti-Aircraft Battery Enfield in Middlesex, and subsequently became acting Lieutenant Colonel of an anti-aircraft regiment. In his fertile imagination, this vast hill fort at Maiden Castle was one of the true ancient British redoubts, standing al alone against the tide of Roman legionaries recruited from across the European continent, much like, of course, Hitler's Wehrmacht overrunning much of continental Europe in 1940. Um, Mortimer Wheeler, the archeologist, became Colonel Wheeler, the artilleryman, and wove a tale in which the ancient Britons of the Duotriges became the gallant Britons of Fortress Britain. Um, even as he wrote it up, though, he did occasionally admit that perhaps this wasn't entirely the case. Um, he, he said at the end of his report of August 1941, the wreckage of the past has in these days been more instant to my mind than, 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 than the wreckage, uh, as the wreckage of the present. And in fact, later analysis, particularly in the 1980s of this site, reveals there's actually very little archaeological evidence to back his theory. Uh, this melodramatic idea of uh, an you know, ancient British defiance of the Romans. Most of the ancient Britons are gone by the time the Romans were there, um, and they all got on quite well. The idea of a massacre of Britons um, hardly squares with um, the evidence of a couple being buried with the leg of lamb for their journey to the afterlife. Not something you'll do in the heat of battle, is it really? Make sure you have some lamb with you. Um, it, th there are some buried soldiers, but it's likely that they, these were results of local skirmishes. So interesting how, though, that Maiden Castles always seize the national imagination. And although we now know we think what happened, Mortimer Wheeler's very World War II based uh, narrative is still a very powerful one. Interpreting our heritage to match expectation rather than the perceived truths of history can lead, of course, to oversimplification, and as we say, being economical with the truth, generating myths which are soon taken for fact. Let's take two celebrated art historical case histories with which I was involved fairly recently. Fascinating things. Um, again, it's all about the power of expectation. Here's a, um, a splendid uh, oil painting, The Last Race of Datchet, we think by Francis Barlow of around 1687. Um, it's something um, that came into the Royal Collection in 1920. Owen Morshead, the Royal Librarian, was delighted to acquire this 
He was skipping around. He sends lovely letters, which the Royal Collection kindly shared with us, saying, oh, what a delightful little picture. It's something which, which anyone who is interested in horse racing have been looking for for decades. The first depiction in oils of a horse race in Britain, or horse race in the world, full stop. Um, the guess was that the engraving, which we already knew about by Barlow, dated 1687, authenticated, was as often the case, as you know, with engravings taken off the oil painting. Um, so hurrah, we found this wonderful oil painting. Very recently, and um, last couple of years, the Royal Collection looked at the picture again and said, um, it's not what it thinks it is. Um, it had been deliberately painted as, a, as an approximate after this engraving you see here. Um, and indeed was, was cr created to make a mint off the rather gullible purchases of the Royal Collection. Um, the Royal Collection went further recently and actually x-rayed it. Um, why um, Owen Morshead was justified perhaps in being hoodwinked was um, it was actually painted on a 17th century canvas with a 17th century frame. But can you see that what the artist around 1920 did was paint over an Italian seascape. Can you see the the ship on the on the left hand side. Um, so yeah, what, what's marvellous is the Royal Collection have, have made this into a great story, uh, and Lucy Whitaker um, in particular deserves great praise for a very interesting and revealing narrative which she's constructed around this. In a similar vein, a picture which um, we were going to include in exhibition um, for ten years. Some of you will know I uh, was fortunate enough to be chief executive of Compton Verney. Art Gallery in Park. Um, we have a wonderful British folk art collection and we, um, in uh, 2014, we staged a big exhibition with Tate Britain on folk art. One of the things that um, Tate were going to borrow from the Yale Centre for British Art in New Haven was a game of cricket. Similar idea, the first depiction in oils of a cricket match. Hurrah, just what we'll be expecting. What, what a lovely thing to have. But as we were preparing for the exhibition, Tate had another look and said, actually, it's not 1740, 1748, but 1948. Again, it had been painted for gullible purchasers. The power of misconception is strong, particularly when that misconception is fostered by TV and film, which seem to be have far more power. A lovely example of Nigel Nicholson, uh, the author, um, who took issue in, in the uh, letters column of the Times with the depiction of real life at Knoll in Kent, a lovely National Trust house, which I'm sure you all know, in the 1996 TV series Portrait of a Marriage, which focused on his parents, Peter Sackville West and Nigel Nicholson, seen here. Um, Nigel um, um, sent, uh, sorry, Harold Nicholson uh, and, and Peter Sackville West. Nigel sent a letter to the Times saying, well, just taking issue with one particular scene, more, more in, in you know, sorrow than in anger. He said, well, Vita and her mother were dining in one scene in full evening dress, sitting at opposite ends of a long table. Their meal was finished, but two footmen in livery stood impassively along one side of the table while Vita and her mother discussed sex. But he said, in 1910, mothers did not discuss sex with their daughters, let alone in front of the servants. Uh, they would not be wearing evening dress, nor the footman livery. They would be sitting side by side at a much smaller table. The key, the punchline here is the reaction from the TV director, who, who replied in the letters column of the Times. Uh, Stephen Whitaker said, take your point, but the scene needed highlighting in a way that the audience expected. <laughs> That's a rather worrying phrase, isn't it? And then comes something even worse. It was more truthful than actuality. <laughs> what, a, what an Orwellian phrase, a rather chilling phrase. Um, going for a rather, if this is an easy target, I'm not the first person to, to uh, look at this. Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. If you, if you want to read more about some of these issues, David Lowenthal's wonderful book, The Heritage Crusade, is a great read. Uh, as he said, this is what Plymouth Rock is where the colonists ought to have stepped ashore in 1620. It was largely made up in the interwar years. As Larry Lambs, the critic, said, it's been disappointing school children for generations. I love that. Um, David Lowenthal did, did had a look at the visitor's book. His point in his book was that 
um, visitors are simply confused by this recreation rather than enlightened and inspired that the ship is a, a replica made in Britain, hurrah, in Brixham. Uh, the, the, the rock, but, yeah, we need a rock, so let's put 1620 on it. There we go. They must have stepped off on this. It's all made up. He said the result is just um, confusing. He comes across some lovely entries in the visitor's book showing that the, the, the mission has failed. Uh, one entry says, why doesn't the rock say 1492? Confusing the, the, the Mayflower immigrants with Columbus. In a similar vein, where are the Nina and Pinta, as in the other two ships that Columbus took with him? Um, I love this one. Where is the sword? As in, <laughs> as in the sword and the stone. And the best one of all, uh, a little comment. How did he get all those animals on that little boat? <laughs> Again, rather close to home, let's use a, 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 an Oxford example, which we, we do know about, but it's fascinating, again, the power of expectation and wishful thinking. This is a, a witch's ladder from the Pitt Rivers Museum, and it's catalogued as such in the Pitt Rivers. We borrowed it at Compton Burnley for an exhibition. Um, it had been given by the wife of the widow of the anthropologist Edward Burnett Tyler to the Pitt Rivers in 1911. And Anna said, an old woman who said to be a witch died, and this was found in an attic and sent to my husband. It was described as made of stag's feathers, as in cock's feathers, and was thought to be used for getting away milk from neighbours' cows. Um, it, was, yeah, and it was assumed this is a, a witch's ladder. It's a, an evil object. Um, but, and, and one of the key reasons why they fell for it was this was found next door to a witch's broom in an attic, so it must be part of the, the witch's kit, possibly, along with the, the black hat we've seen. Um, but very obviously, everyone, say, everyone else says more recently, it's a deer scarab that you hung, hang from trees. Um, but what's interesting is uh, contemporary artists we work with at Compton Burnley didn't want to know about that. No, no, it's a witch's ladder. The, the idea of that the fiction is, is more engaging than the truth. It's not just a deer scarab, it really is a... Um, uh, something more evocative, something more melodramatic. Less melodramatic is um, another example, this time from Comte de itself. Um, again, the power of misconception. Uh, our wonderful folk art collection at Comte de includes this object, um, which uh, the original collector Andrus Kalman believed was a trade sign for a grocer's. Um, and you can see it, it presumably hung from a bracket above a shop until you know, uh, an expert said, well, actually, no, it's, uh, it's just a big grater. Uh, it's a, and it's not British, it's German. It's a cabbage grater for sauerkraut, a huge one. But, uh, um, but, but we were still, we had both, both narratives in our description. So you could see how its interpretation had involved, evolved. Um, the power of restoration uh, to create misleading new narratives is strong. Um, Let's go to um, this wonderful uh, cartoon, which I know that the, the script may be difficult to read, but you can get the idea from the pictures. Um, uh, this is from a magazine of 27th of June, 1877, just at the time when William Morris, who has connections with, our, uh, with number 62 here, um, was creating his manifesto for the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Um, the punchline at the end of this cartoon is, that's what the original designer evidently intended. As you can see, the original designer on the, on the top produces something very plain and sober. And the restorer, bottom right, uh, produces something very florid and over the top. But at the same time, it's easy to condemn. It's, you have to bear in mind the historical and the cultural context. Uh, to illustrate that, I just I love this cartoon, so it was a good excuse to show it. And David Howell Haldane's wonderful punch cartoon of 1981. Uh, the punchline is beats me how they got planning permission. Um, good example of something that the SPAB manifesto of 1877 used was the fate of St Albans Abbey, financed and redesigned by Lord Grimthorpe after 1878. There's a before and after of the West Front. But you know, while we can decry Grimthorpe's well-intentioned but clumsy restoration. At the same time, St Albans Abbey was in bad structural nick. If he hadn't intervened, would it now be a romantic ruin? Similarly, I mean, we can cite all sorts of buildings. There's Staple Inn, before and after. It was re in 1886, Staple Inn 
uh, in the heart <coughs> excuse me, of Hoven in London. And indeed, in 1937, the facade you see on the right was, was literally facaded in the building behind demolished. But, um, you know, at least, at least we have the facade still there, you know, rather than a modern block. A good, an obvious example, and, and with uh, uh, um, the current context very much in mind, uh, Windsor Castle, before and after Geoffrey Wyattville, disnified the castle, if you like, for King George IV after 1824. But one of his key um, achievements, as you can see, is to make that central tower. Can you see on the left, um, from the view of 1819, that rather low central tower? As you see on the right, Whiteville gave it a, a far higher and nobler prospect, looking like a castle ought to look. And indeed, a, a lot of the work you see behind is more Whiteville than medieval. Doesn't make it any less valid. Same with Hampton Court. Um, which opened to the public as early as 1882. But again, much of what you're looking at is work done in the 18, uh, late 1870s, early 80s. And an obvious example is, which Simon Thurley in recent years was, was very impressively came clean in that he said, here we are at the Wolsey Closet uh, in Hampton Court. Virtually every element here does derive, if not from Wolsey's time, at least in the 16th century, but it's all been put together rather like, you know, Lego. Um, none of this belonged to each other. As you can see, if you look at the frieze, um, it's all very awkward. It bashes in at the corner. It's all made up for effect in the 19th century. Doesn't mean it, that's, it's any the worse for that. And, and a really good example is a city which, well, still promotes itself very much as a medieval city, Chester in England, Britain's Bruges, if you like, which really was remodeled in the 1890s thanks to uh, the funding of the, the richest man in Britain, the first Duke of Westminster. And it's gorgeous, <coughs> but it is far more of the 1890s than the 1390s. And so I mean, we could go on all day, but a really good example, again, back to the idea, the concept of St Albans Abbey. Bodium Castle, Bodium Castle, um, wonderful National Trust property, um, falling to bits at the beginning of the 20th century, originally a, a 15th century structure, it was um, restored by its owner from 1916, Lord Curzon, who had the, the canny fortune to marry not just one, but two American heiresses. Well done him. In succession, not at the same time. Um, and the result is, again, what a 15th century castle ought to look like. There were no, we had no idea what it originally did look like, but this is an approximation of what it should have looked like. Even our great UNESCO World Heritage Sites are not always as they seem. Um, here is the Arch of Titus in Rome, depicted by Laura Piranesi on the left and today on the right. See how little there was left in the, the mid, the later 18th century. Recreated largely as so many of the monuments of ancient Rome were by Giuseppe Belladier, the Franco-Italian sculptor and architect during the 1820s. But, does that make it any less valuable? You just have to be aware, I think, or take into account the cultural context and the history of, 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 it, of what's happened to it. And the same, the place I mentioned before, gorgeous place, one of my favourite cities. Here we are, Bruges in Belgium. In fact, one has to say, re-medievalised with British money in the 1860s and 70s, big, wealthy British community here, to make it look more authentic but yeah how lovely it is and of course we all love going around Bruges and what an astonishing place it is um, and someone which actually has um, made a, a virtue of its recreation uh, rightly Carcassonne in the south of France um, restored of course as everyone knows now it is not medieval it is more it's all about Eugène Viollet le duc who restored it from 1853 but when it was created a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1997 UNESCO said it's, it's about as much of the Ville le Duc's achievement as the achievement of the original medieval masons. The creation of um, false narratives can be accidental or simply lazy scholarship. I'm cite a, an interesting uh, example from, again, from Compton Burney. This wonderful painting, one of the gallery's finest, I think. Willem Scrotts. Uh, great name. Um, it sounds like sheep's disease, but no, no, he was the court painter who followed Hans Holbein um, in 1543. This is 
Scrotz's depiction of Edward VI, a very icon iconic, and I mean looking like an icon, a profile depiction of 1549, um, which um, we, at Confirmation, we'd followed the, the Sotheby's catalogue description of, of this as, as being full of healthy plants because this was for the ailing boy king who yeah, we know not long to live, of course, died in 1553, only four years later. Um, and um, even though I'm, I'm not a plantsman at all, but even though I knew that um, um, the, it was said that the, the big tall plant in the middle was sunflowers, I thought that's not a sunflower, is it? So I talked to our wonderful head of landscape, Gary Webb. We reattributed all the plants and also got a dear friend um, who's a classics professor to retranslate the rubric at the, at the bottom. And it's, it's something completely different. It's all these, all these plants are actually um, heliotropic plants that follow the sun. That's actually wild garlic in the center. And they're looking at him. And if you can see the sun, S-U-N, top le left, which I think looks very much like his dad, Henry VIII, is, is you know, rather annoyed because now they're all looking to the new one, an, an alter ego, which you see on the right hand side, was my classics expert said, originally not, not in the context of we use the phrase today, alter ego, but actually meant another one. So it's, it's he's like, this was a, de, you know, a determined attempt to shore up the Tudor dynasty. Edward the, Edward the, um, Edward the Sixth may be um, young, but he's just like his dad. In fact, he did seem to be very much like his father. Um, he, he, this has nothing to do about illness or whatever. He's, he's the, the, the fount of, of, of the all patronage. He is the new son, S-U-N. Um, but I think what, what has happened in these feeding years is the influence of, of this book in particular, The Prince and the Pauper, and Mark Twain's famous 1871 book made into countless films, TV series. What the major um, um, idea of this was that the, the boy King Edward VI was dying. He was, he was gonna die. Um, it's actually not true at all. I mean, in fact, Edward was a very lusty, healthy child, as you see in that wonderful Holbein of him as a little child in 1538, but you can see dressed as an adult with the, his little rattle as a, as a scepter. Um, in fact, Edward was only carried away in 1553 by a, a stomach infection, which these days, here's some antibiotics, off you go, but then killed him off. So Nick, what's fascinating is looking back at what we see, what, what you think was true and what isn't. Far worse perhaps is, and here, here we have um, the picture with, with our reattributed plants and uh, um, a, a new look at, at Edward who you know, could have been just like his father. If not, if not better. Um, worse is when new orthodoxies are exploited for financial gain, of course, and we all know examples of this. Do you remember the, the older listeners of uh, the Hitler diaries um, fabricated by Conrad Kujau uh, in the, and there is Kujau uh, at the back in this picture, um, and validated in, in one of the uh, least clever uh, things he did by Professor Hugh Trevor Roper here uh, for the Sunday Times. And eventually these were sold for 9.3 million Deutschmarks as they then were, so about $3.7 million to Stern magazine. Uh, no, it was all, they were all made up. And um, more insidious, and I've just used the example from modern culture because I, I got annoyed with this, as did many other people. Let's look at a, a feature film from 2000. U571. Anyone remember that? I refuse to see it on principle. Um, the, the, the idea of the, the this plot has a, an American submarine crew, led of course by Matthew McConaughey and Harvey Keitel, who helped the Allies to win the war by seizing a vital cipher decoding machine, effectively an Enigma machine, but they don't call it that, from the Germans. But actually, as everyone, as certainly everyone in this country pointed out when it came out, uh, wait a minute, um, this is actually a British achievement. HMS Bulldog in 1941 uh, intercepted U110 to capture the first naval Enigma machine in May of that year, seven months before the US entered the war. Um, and of course, 
um, the filmmakers said, much as we saw Stephen Whitaker early saying, no, no, this is this is reconfiguring the narrative for a new for a new audience. No, it's sort of fibbing, really. Uh, Tony Blair, then Prime Minister, rightly said, in my view, that the film was an affront to British sailors, and I think he's absolutely right. Far better, surely, to be honest and open in interpreting and communicating our cultural heritage. Um, something I mentioned earlier, but something that's perhaps a cornerstone to today's lecture is William Morris's Manifesto for the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, the, the, the keeper of the flame for, for architectural conservation in Britain, still going strong today. Produced in 1877, which called for honesty and integrity in building conservation. And indeed, as Morris did in, in his other works, in life. He saw each home owner, each building owner, merely as a custodian for future generations, not, a, not a, an idea that's hugely popular today. He particularly condemned, quote, the strange idea of the restoration of ancient building, which implies that it is possible to strip from a building this, that, and the other part of its history, and then to stay the hand at some arbitrary point and leave it still historical living and even as it once was. Moreover, in the course of this process of destruction and addition, the appearance of antiquity is taken away from such old parts as, of the fabric as are left. And there is no laying to rest in the spectator the suspicion of what might have been lost. And in short, and this is the key phrase in a way, a feeble and lifeless forgery is the final result of all the wasted labor which our descendants will find useless for study and chilling for enthusiasm. It's, I think everyone should, and certainly anyone involved with, with the cultural world should to always remember William Morris's words, really, really important. In just saying, look, there's nothing, you know, find it if you want to change something or, or add things on, but just be honest in what you're doing. Don't pretend they're something they are not. Of course, this, I know Morris would have agreed, although he might have been rather, um, is a good example of something where um, we've now come clean. Here's the Wolsey closet again in, in a recent uh, a recent view, um, where again Simon Thurley, uh, former um, um, historical palaces um, um, officer, did say, "Look, that, as you can see, you can see clearer here that those freeze pictures. Could you see they really don't belong there at all? They've been sort of cut down and shoved in. Each element is generally." apart from some of the stars and rails, is generally 16th century, but it's nice that we're honest about the Wolsey closet. Doesn't devalue it in any means. How interesting that in the 1880s, this was cobbled together to, to create the idea of a Tudor closet. There's always a, a place for historical fantasy. I'm not sure William Morris would particularly appear, um, find this particularly appealing. This is Herbert Dickens Ryman's very famous Cinderella Castle at Disney World. But yeah, it, it's what it is what it is. And it's not pretending to be something it is not. Um, there's always a place for historical fantasy. I think it's just important to make sure we keep the fantasy separate from what we perceive, at least today, as being historical reality. Two good examples. When I was at Compton Verney, I got to know our wonderful neighbours at Warwick Castle very well. Uh, a, a fantastic place, um, which originally dates in 1086. Uh, both uh, Warwick Castle and many other en entertainments, such as the London Dungeon, are owned by Merlin Entertainment. And the chief executive Warwick kept saying to me, it it's been an uphill struggle, but I think we're there. We're trying to say to Merlin, look, but we're not Legoland, we're not the London Dungeon. We've got real history. Let's celebrate, rather than making up things, let's celebrate the stories relevant to our own, our own castle. What was fascinating was there, were just, there was genuine evidence of ghosts, for example. And even the chief executive said, I don't believe in these things, but I've been pushed from behind by a, uh, by a ghostly hand, or perhaps as one of his staff, a bit uh, depressed at but his, uh, his or her fate. But, um, it, and yet, you know, Merlin in the, original, in the first years was trying to get us to put up sort of fake medievalism. He said, we've got the real stories, we've got the real people here, let's celebrate them. And I'm pleased to say his, his view uh, won out. I think the, uh, what um, he was saying at, at Warwick was that the past should be an inspiration, a comfort, rather than a source to be mined 
but this information is something I think we all would learn very much from in every walk of our lives today. Thank you very much. Well, it ended on an appalling piece of self-promotion. <laughs> um, Stephen, I think you were happy to take questions. Absolutely. Um, we do actually have one from the uh, online chat room. So if I can start by asking Please do. Yeah. So David is saying um, he'd like to know more about the forger of the Hitler diaries. And he's saying, how was the person identified? And was he prosecuted for fraud or otherwise punished? He was. He was prosecuted. And it's easy to say in hindsight, isn't it? And, and for those who don't know Hugh Trevor Roper, Trevor Roper was a very august Oxford historian, registered professor of modern history here, who had actually met, well not Hitler, but met many of the Nazi hierarchs in 1945-6. He was a part of the team that interviewed many of them in 45-46. So although more of a Tudor historian, it was be believed that he really did have a, a good idea of, of, of that time. Um, and he would be able to really perceive whether this was real or not. Sadly, um, they, what, what basically the Sunday Times should have done is take more, more views rather than just Trevor Roper. So Trevor Roper was left looking very silly indeed. They did um, prosecute Kuja. I think the key reason was that um, he made so much money out of it. Yeah, and he was sent to prison. Any questions from the floor? I was interested in your points about trying to make something uh, more true than the original version, but I, I have a perhaps interesting current perspective on a recent event, and I'm curious about your, um, your view on this. The Occupy movement at St Paul's was obviously very widely covered in the press, and there's a story about that that we all think is true. I happen to know for various reasons uh, rather more about what went on behind the scenes, which is not known, um, certainly not yet known. And there was a, a play uh, in which Simon Russell Beale starred called Temple about the Occupy movement, and I saw it. And although some of this is deliberately fictionalised, I felt, just a personal view, that it had an authenticity that perhaps some of the coverage in the press, which was supposed to be factual, did not have. And I'm just curious about whether you think that could possibly be a valid view, and just generally about the sort of cultural development of how we see events in the past. Very interesting question. It comes up time and time again, doesn't it? Whenever there's a, um, a play or a film made about real events, uh, and this has happened very recently then, uh, the family that's involved said, no, you've misrepresented. One, as everyone says, well, this is not a documentary. We're not looking. But also, in that sense, I think you're right. The, the idea, perhaps, of, of what happened is, is perhaps more important than getting the details right. But I know, um, for example, the, the, I haven't seen it myself, the Richard III film that's come out has got a lot of stick for misrepresenting actually the university academics who actually were there to help rather than to hinder. But that's not how they're portrayed. But it, it does make for a stronger story and then reaches a far wider audience. So yeah, it is difficult. There's no easy answer, I suppose. Um, it does, you know, plays and, and TV and film do just help broadcast that issue far more widely than, than academic um, um, articles and, and books. So. Um, it's all it's an interesting recourse. Um, I was wondering if you have um, a, a view on when uh, a restoration should be done. I'm thinking of Magdalen College Tower. Magdalen College Tower, uh, is, is, it, is, it, is it a decision that has to be made? Because it, 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 to me, it was rebuilt the tower almost from the outside. Uh, is there a decision, uh, it's simply structurally unsound and therefore has to be rebuilt, or, or uh, what, what, when, because it sometimes it, it stops being real any longer. Oh, very good point, and that's actually a, a crucial issue. 
behind a lot of what I've just said, a very good issue, which actually applies to an awful lot of Oxford University buildings. Uh, I suppose the, the key answer is when things start falling off and being a danger to passers-by or inhabitants, then that's when you need to work. But um, the whole history, as you say, the whole history of Oxford building is, um, is a fraught one. And of course, I mean, take the emperor's heads around the Sheldon, you know, they're in their third incarnation at the moment. Um, doesn't mean they're any less valuable in that, that sense, but yeah, we, we are back to that John Betjeman idea of antiquarian prejudice, just because it's old doesn't mean necessarily it's better. But suddenly a lot of the universities started rebuilding or building anew in the 19th century using Headington stone from the Headington quarries um, to the east of here, which seemed to be just like wonderful Cotswold limestone, but a lot nearer, a lot cheaper. Well, it wasn't because the Headington stone may have looked the same, but it's far more, um, far more feeble. It acted as blotting paper for um, pollution. If any, if any of you have looked at, and actually the slide I showed in the unit earlier on, shows a little bit about what Oxford looked like in the early 20th century. In fact, all the way up to the 1960s, Oxford was black and peeling and bits are falling off. And that Headington limestone, uh, uh, virtually every key building in Oxford was repaired using that. Um, it's failed, you know, it was dropping off, um, it was you know, sucking up pollution. So in 1968, um, sorry, long answer, but in 1968, the university began uh, with the city, um, its cleaning program, which continued right the way through the next decade and beyond. Um, but as you say, a lot of that was, particularly in some of the early years when it was water blasting, not the best way to clean historic structures, because again, and that happened at the front of Maudlin too, where they cleaned it with water blasting, and it, again, like blotting paper, it just sucked up the dirt. Um, where often the whole top layer was completely replaced, so what you've got is there isn't much original fabric left. That is the, that is the problem, I mean, if, if one is cynical, look, you can look at a lot of buildings, not just Oxford anywhere, I think, how much really is left? Um, the fact that Notre Dame done before its horrific fire, was largely, an awful lot is, is what Violet Le Duc had done. Uh, and the same with Westminster Abbey in London. Yeah, an awful lot is George Gilbert Scott and John Loughborough Pearson, the very heavy handed restorations of the 1860s, 70s and onwards. So it doesn't make it any less interesting as a building, but you're right, the fact that if, if something is called um, old, a particular date, Good example, sorry, just up the road is Upton House. Anyone know that? Uh, uh, just on the Oxfordshire Warwickshire board, a lovely National Trust house, which for many years the National Trust portrayed as a, a 17th century house, and the facade is 17th century, sure, but actually it was completely remodeled inside with a huge great elliptical um, hole in the middle of the first floor, so you would look down, gallery. Um, it's, it's really all about the, the interwar years, and Lord Best did, the shell tycoon who completely we did it and, in, and bought the wonderful collections that went in. Doesn't make it any less valuable. In fact, it makes Upton House a far more interesting house. But what's nice now is that the Trust don't pretend it's a 17th century house. It was originally, but you know, just saying that it's all, it's all been rebuilt, as you say. So the beginning of the talk, you mentioned things such as like January 6th and the kind of selective interpretation of like facts. How do you see that playing out looking forward where even with presented with the, the truth or video people choose to believe what they want? Yeah, there's no, I mean, that's the power of film for a start. It is far more evocative than, than reading a book. Um, I think you just need a, a balanced view and also the ability of other people to come back and, and challenge those, you know, as we now say, fact checking and per, perhaps creating an alternative view of what's been said. But yeah, the, the, the power of film is, is huge. And I think it, it so easily sways us in the way that the written word doesn't. We've got one final, time for one final question and I'll ask it from the chat if I may. So it's from Patricia. And she's saying, how do you manage situations such as Upark that's up up in uh, West, West Sussex. Um, do you restore or stabilise? And if you restore, how do you make it clear to visitors what is original and what is modern? 
Very good question. Um, I know the cases. You know all know about Upper, wonderful, well, originally 17th century house, which burned down um, in, of course, 19, 1990, early 1990s. Um, I, I knew the, the team who were working on it after the fire. It was three days before the end of restoration. Uh, and a, you need supervision of workmen. A workman was working with a blowtorch at the back of the pediment at the top of the house and some wood caught fire and it, the fire went right across the top and down and the whole thing um, burst into flames. Good news was, no one was hurt for a start, was that visitors were there. And it's a wonderful story. Um, the visitors of the day formed a human chain to get a lot of the contents out, which is important to answering this question. And also, as has happened at other fires like that, the fire, um, really, the, the outer walls were relatively good nick at the end. It was the contents and all the floors collapsed. Um, to, to take your, your questioner's um, um, point, the SPAB, who I've talked about a lot, yes, they are the, the keepers of the flame for conservation. They also always take a very, a very rigidly um, um, honest line said right if the original's gone we just need a modern box or a set of modern boxes um, to put the collections back in so you have a sort of museum basically um i was then working at the georgian group and that wasn't a, a an idea that we wanted to back we wanted it to be recreated in our park's case actually the final uh, arbiter was the, were the insurers who said no we're not going to uh, pay for anything apart from recreation they later regretted saying that because it was jolly expensive. Um, but hurry for them, because unusually, as didn't happen, say, with Clandon Park, that awful fire, that, that um, most of the contents were saved. Um, same with Windsor Castle in 1992. Most of the concept, contents, apart from some pictures um, fixed into the walls, were saved. So I think in that sense, re well, it's interesting, recreation, as long as one is being honest, say, this is work, of um, the 1990s. And what um, Upark's done, what Hampton Court's done, I think Windsor's done as well, is still keep a little element of, of what it looked like after the fire, to remind people this has been rebuilt, to some extent, back to your point, recreated. This is new built. At Windsor Castle, what's interesting, that um, St George's Chapel was rebuilt after the Windsor fire um, to be slightly bigger and taller than it had been before. And the Pla Whiteville's plaster ceiling was replaced by a wooden ceiling. It's not, not really conservation there, but um, um, that's what they decided to do. So at least they're honest about it, not passing it off as, as original. So a good, a good example, thank you. Thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our session now. So um, I'm going to say, Stephen, thank you so much for a really thought-provoking, fascinating talk. And thanks to everyone who's been watching online, wherever you are. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you, Dr. Stephen Crozier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming to Meeting Minds, too. I'm instructed to say, don't fret. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.